Welcome back to Just the Digital. We talk about today's most modern titles and the classics that inspire them. I'm your host, Brett Clark. And I'm Matt Keaton. And today we're discussing our favorite genres of games and highlighting some of the pretenders and some that contend for the top spot. Yes. And we're also joined this week with Tim. Tim, thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. And also make sure everybody y'all stick around for the safe point where we answer your questions and talk about some of your comments. All right here on Just the Digital. So... Matt, the writers were so great this week to actually give us an outline once again. And uh, the first topic we're talking about is RPGs. Mm-hmm. I know Tim's talked about RPGs quite a bit before. Um, we'll let Tim go first here because he's our guest. And then we'll continue on from there. Tim, what, what RPGs are your are your contenders? Definitely. Thank you for having me again. And uh, so my top spots usually are going to go to loot-based games. I can't help it. I just I love the grind. So always having new stuff to grind for and find uh, makes a game fun to me. So top three, I would easily throw Borderlands out there, Destiny out there. Um, even even though it's not necessarily full loot and, loot and shoot, the division was fun. It just got kind of overhyped a little too quickly. And then fortunately, with the updates that they did to it, it became a contender. Whereas what it started as was not that good. When they've taken it to further levels, it did become a full fledged game though. Uh, so those are all some of my contenders whereas compared to things like anthem where they promise the world and give you nothing very very drastic differences um there's also games that have you know phenomenal storylines that are you know i'm a huge tales of tales of anything tales of uh symphonia zistria uh zillia zillia 2 tons of them i've played pretty much all of them and great storylines to them in terms of role-playing games so those are kind of my top in you know the funness of getting a story and f- becoming attached to characters and then you have classics like final fantasy 7 obviously we know some of, some of us have beaten it some of us not so much yet but we're yeah. working on it and i would say that those storylines that we kind of grew up with involved us in that world where we actually got more and more into it and made it for for a great storytelling I, I i really agree with that like you know with with rpgs if the story's not good you know that's why you're playing an rpg is for the role play for the story i mean like with a first person shooter if the story lacks no one really cares but uh matt you're playing final fantasy 7 and you're like taking forever in a day to beat it like <laughs> <laughs> is it not good? Do you not like it as an RPG? Like, where, where are you at with that? So, if, as an RPG, it's actually up there for me. Uh, just not having enough time in the in the day to to get it done. Uh, it's on me. No excuses. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't like to sit here and complain, but I just haven't had the time. But I'm working on it. it it's fun. It's a it's a it's a it's a walk down memory lane for me because I had it originally on PlayStation. And uh, I had the special, you know, like the, the I think the game case is like really fat and had all those discs, and uh, it's it's a trip down memory lane. It's a fun one. I'm enjoying it, and uh, the only my only criticism is the combat. It's a little bit repetitive, <laughs> but uh, thankfully, due to the new technology, they've implemented three times speed, and they've implemented no interactions in between like walking points. And uh, the, I'll tell you, I don't like to use it. I did it on stream a little bit. I felt kind of cheap, <laughs> but. Uh, that health uh, health grab, the health boost, limit boost, really helped to save my skin. Mm. Yeah. What about uh, what about other RPGs? Like what? I mean, you're, I've when I think of the games that you play, you play more of like you know action adventures. Mm-hmm. It's not really going deep into the traditional stat based RPG. What what's your experience there? Uh, well, I mean, for the most part, for RPGs, I'm looking at the top crown. I'm looking at The Witcher. I'm looking at um, Fallout. I'm looking at Skyrim. I'm looking at games like that. And for me, those just set the bar so high. And it's not necessarily... If you look at Skyrim, um, my first experience was on PlayStation 3. And I haven't talked much about Skyrim, and I know there's all those people out there that could. Um, My first experience was pretty bad. I wasn't a fan of it. Um, The graphics were really terrible on PS3. Um, and it just was a very, very much muttered, muddled down mess. Um, mm-hmm. Come up to the next generation when they remastered the game, I really got into it, and I kind of did some background on the lore, had some fun with it, and then you know the whole arrow to the neath meme took off, and then mm-hmm. it was so popular and everything. But I just think that 
over the time period with Skyrim, I, I became a fan of it, and I became I started to really enjoy the the Elder Scrolls lore and really see that the, the grand scope of things. And I think those are the top. That's one of the top my top uh, favorite RPGs of all time, just because of the fact that. It's so in depth, and there's so much literature in the in the world to pick up and read. There's so many things to go and see. I've probably put like two thousand man hours into the game, and I haven't touched any, but probably anywhere near even the entire map. So it's something I definitely want to go back to. Games like The Witcher, you could sit there and talk all day about that. That's mm-hmm. definitely top quality. And to be honest, I'm kind of at a at a standstill. I really haven't played any terrible RPGs other than if you would go with Anthem. An action looter kind of um, muddled mess. That mm-hmm. and the division too. The division originally was a great concept and had mm-hmm. its very very minor scaled back uh, RPG elements. Just like it was thrown in there just to, to pull in a different crowd. And once they started like really turning things up a notch with the division two, I was like all in, bought in. One, um, I couldn't wait to get on the ground in DC. Loved the opening cinematic. Had a blast with it, but. I just felt like the RPG mechanics were not as fun when you played solo. It was mm-hmm. meant as something that you play with your friends. You pick up and play. And I'd love to get in there with you guys and just like have at it. Um, something like Ghost Recon as well, Breakpoint, is definitely mm-hmm. kind of definitely a better skill tree than The Division, in my opinion. Um, but again, the RPG mechanics are just fluff. And so I would say any kind of pretender for me would be just one of those games that really doesn't have all-out rpg mechanics um something that just kind of takes from other genres and you know it seems like nowadays anything that's trying to be assassin's creed is a pretender because uh (laughs) they just that that's like the one franchise that's been borrowed from the most i feel with climbing the towers and the, the skill tree progressions and things like that so when i think rpg though i think fallout i think skyrim i think the witcher things like that um mass effect mass effect the big a big, no. big, big RPG franchise for me. Love it. Even though you hate the... I know you hate the third game. Or you hate the ending. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just... I can't talk enough about Mass Effect. And little little throw in there. I cannot wait for the remastering of, of uh, Mass Effect. I know we were talking... Tim and I were talking about that earlier today. Just mm-hmm. had to throw that in there. I am so stoked to see what they do to upgrade the mechanics and the shoot, shooting mechanics and just everything. I'm just like... That's... I'm, I'm stoked. Tim, I got a question for you. When you played Breakpoint with Matt, where do you think games like Breakpoint and The Division like fail? Where do you think those games are not able to be successful, even though they've put a lot of R&D into it? So what I would say in, in terms of games specifically like Breakpoint or The Division is when they lopside things. So Breakpoint is a good example of this where you can't be a healer. You can't be that defensive tank for your team to pull aggro. Because of that, there's not too much in terms of, of like having multiple classes or different variants of gameplay style. Now, I will say that The Division... Originally, like D, you know, Division One, it was all about DPS output. That was all that mattered. No one cared. However, I think you brought this up in a past podcast with us, where Division Two, if you actually had the ability to throw down a med kit, you could out heal the the you know glass mm-hmm. cannon and kill them faster than they could kill you because you were able to support yourself. Mm-hmm. So I, I would say that original concept for it is good but when they lopside it to where it's just whoever can output the most damage with their weapon wins that's where they they fall short because they get so hyped into who can you know get the biggest numbers in dps output that's all that matters having a counter mechanic to where you know your tank pulling aggro can lower that dps to yourself or an ability to heal yourself makes the game more fun and it gives a reason behind it um those are the main fallbacks to those is where they kind of cut themselves off at the knee of, Oh, it's not just who can shoot. It's, it's Mm -hmm. got role playing to it and it's actually got skill and there's different class features. Well, if all the class features, you know, are are useless other than boosting your damage, who cares if you have others that are, that they've put R and D into and they actually programmed into the game because you're basically selling yourself short you did all that programming to make it be a second uh, like a second thought of the game no i agree with that 
I agree with that 100%. Because one of the things that I really dislike about The Division is the, the bullet sponge aspect of it. Mm-hmm. But then you look at games like Destiny, and then you realize, okay, like, if I killed everything, there's no reason for me to level up a gun, you know, and try to grind for something better. Uh, and I really liked The Division 1. Like, the, the Super 90 was a shotgun that I got. It was a purple shotgun I got in the Dark Zone. And I rocked that thing forever. If someone jumped on me, I could just one-shot anybody. And that was something that I really liked about the game was that since it was a random loot drop, sort of like Borderlands, like I, I pretty much had that gun. Like no one could get that role that I had. The The downside to it was that like the, if I wanted to get a gun better than that, I needed to do X, Y, and Z upgrades to it. And then I have to spend a week and a half trying to find the right scope for this and all this other stuff. And I feel like that's where, you know, the RPG uh, genre as, as a whole is kind of, the they people do it really well like ghost of tsushima where it's not really about collecting resources resources kind of help you upgrade minor things but there's an abundance of them there's not like a finite mi- amount of them whereas something like the division and breakpoint there's such a finite amount of resources to level up uh wildlands did a very good job with guns guns were hidden throughout the map i love that element of it i wish more games kind of did that but then you just google it and you find all the guns like yeah. By level two. <laughs> so there, that's kind of the thing with RPGs is where when I look at games that do it really well, it's like Ghost of Tsushima, you know, um, Fallout 3 did it really well. But it, it's games like that where, you know, they're unique and they, they fix a lot of the problems that other genres that it's similar to, or not genres, other franchises that are similar to it fail at. Like Uncharted is better than Tomb Raider because Uncharted took things that Tomb Raider didn't and had a more like cinematic story not so much about the puzzles and you know what it's a different experience ghost of tsushima took almost all the things from assassin's creed from climbing exploration and removed all the meaningless crap you know and it was really good like i I love that so you look at valhalla versus ghost of tsushima and you've got completely two different games that are still built on the open world concept and we brought this up in a podcast is is the open world concept overused and I think that's one of the things that really hurts RPGs because you have open world RPGs and then you have like more linear story based story based ones like with, you know, the Final Fantasy seven remake. It's a little bit more linear and the the world's semi opened, very similar to Last of Us two and very similar to Uncharted four, where they have these areas that you can explore. But yet really just it's more like a. A cylindrical it's like almost like a funnel more or less like it's still leading you to this finite point in the story you know and i think that's one of the things that for me rpgs really have have an issue with is that there's only so many templates to an rpg that it's the, it's that it's hard to separate sometimes you know you look at ubisoft they release a lot of the same same games just with different like worlds and, and i'm afraid you know to to say like these are really good and then something is compared to it you know it's like when you compare bands from like the past to bands now it's like eventually someone has to do something unique instead of just being like a a tribute to that you know yeah i think um i think they in the future with rpgs they have a chance to do that they have a chance to break out and actually strike where i think they should have some that are restricted so what i mean by that is you a role-playing game you play a role so mm-hmm. you're not going to run into Fallout and, oh, well, what do I do? What kind of weapons do I find? And the, the, the main drag for me is when there's too much player choice and you, you really have to take time to find what's comfortable and then you mm-hmm. stick with it. But then all of a sudden you, you get this feeling like you see someone doing some sniping or something. And you're like, okay, maybe I want to try it out. And it's still, it's just not as good. Like the quality for me in Fallout games is not as good as when you have a pistol and you're up close or a devastating mm-hmm. shotgun up close, um, something that you're like in your face with adrenaline. Um, I think they need to bring back like a like a, a RPG that's like open world, but it's more like grounded in reality, and just like have some restrictions of survival restrictions, um, have some more real world game mechanics built in. Maybe it might not be for everybody, but I think going forward, if they just like limit the scope a little bit and make it a little bit more narrow as to what you can actually carry with your character or your class types and then you have to actually stick with it and play it through those are the best games because if you look at like um if you look at uncharted it's 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 not an rpg it's an open world action game however it works because 
you do t you do play with different weapons, but it's always kind of the same. You know what to do. You have to go from point A to point B to get there. You can use a grenade, rocket launcher, pistol, whatever. And but you have an idea. And in in, in these open world RPG games, especially Ubisoft, you guys mm -hmm. really need to rework this and rethink at the table. Uh, mm -hmm. They put you in a world and they put, oh hey, there's a bunch of the, all these quests on the screen. Go do it, and you do it. But it's like if you don't do it in the proper order. And you, and you don't know what the proper order is. If you don't do it in the right way, you're going to find a level 12 sword that you're you're going to absolutely love. But then when you get to level 15, the level 15 sword is going to be totally ultimate badass numbers, but it's going to look stupid and you're not going to like it. So I think the they need to rethink the, the armor, the weapon progression systems in RPGs and really just give you full player choice. Do I want a weapon that I'm going to have to find an upgrade? Or am I going to want to start with the weapon and upgrade it as you go? It, mm -hmm. That's what I would love to have more RPGs go that route of restricting what you can do and seeing what gamers can come up with. Because I'm, I'm all about coming up with stuff and trying new things and trying new tactics. You know, like running into what we were playing Hunt <laughs> Showdown. And I'm, uh, guys, I <laughs> forgot to select a pistol. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, fully unarmed. Noob, noob happens. Noob happens. Mm. And so I'm like, hey, you guys protected me. You guys were like lighting them up, and then you turn around and I find a gun and I'm contributing. But the whole mm. time I'm I'm playing a role. I'm calling out, hey guys, somebody over there. Oh, I heard a sound. You know. So it's like it forced me to to survive and to not mm -hmm. go into confrontation. And I had a blast. I probably had the most fun that round, knowing I couldn't defend myself i had to be careful so mm -hmm. things like that for sure if they just come up with some more survival mechanic rpgs where you have to follow a certain way to do stuff i really i just think in general that would be more interesting and more challenging and more rewarding as a gamer mm -hmm. tim what do you think what would you like to see in rpgs like done more of and what do you think is kind of hurting the rpg genre so here's 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 basic my basic breakdown for for everything for it. Um, in terms of open world, the reason that game developers do it, I understand it. They want replayability because every time you play it, if you're on a linear story quest, once you've played and beaten the game, you've beaten the game. You know the story, you know what to do, and yeah, you can try to speed run it, but that's not for everyone. Not everybody wants to sit there and play trying to get it frame perfect to get that world record. That's not for everyone. So having an open world is a good concept, but then you run into the same issue where you have metagamers that just jump into YouTube and are like, where is this weapon? They go straight to that weapon, grab the weapon, and now they're completely broken and destroy the rest of the game because they found the, the god tier weapon uh, the games that i enjoy that i used to not even be a fan of i've, I've never been a big survival fan however mm. my wife showed like my wife and one of my best friends got me into seven days to die it's an open world. It's very similar to like Minecraft in terms of building mechanics. You get raw material, you make stuff. However, it takes your player level into account. So the further you progress in the game, the better your gear gets. And to, to Matt's effect, um, having preloaded areas where like Dragon's Dogma, phenomenal game, good storyline, great graphics, uh, a little Dragon Age Inquisition-ish, uh, like, in terms of style. But I, when I first started the game, I didn't follow the road, which is what you're supposed to do. I just wandered off through the woods. Next thing I know, I'm fighting a level 40 Chimera, and I'm like, uh, I, I wandered. I, I'm sorry. I'm level 2. I didn't mean this. I apologize, and I just leave. <laughs> and that's kind of the scenario. So static zones um, are popular in terms of things like World of Warcraft, Dragon's Dogma, um, static roles are, are okay, but that also hinders that replayability, even if you do take the time to build an open world. So what I would say is finding games that progress with your character development. That's I think that's honestly why I kind of took to the Destiny franchise really well, is because everything scales to your character. And just because I'm at 1300 light level, and Matt, as a first-time player, is at 12 a noob. doesn't matter i can jump in with him help him out and the bullet that hurts me doesn't insta kill him so mm -hmm. it takes that into account 
and the way that those systems function is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. It makes it to where the veteran player can have new people jump in and he doesn't have to make a smurf or a dummy account in order to play with them and mm-hmm. make it fun. Um, cause I honestly think that's what the biggest factor for replayability on a game, pl- on a, on a game is, which is something RPGs have struggled with for a long time. All, we all love, um, Final Fantasy seven. We all love legend of the, uh, legend of the Dragoon, um, games that, that really showed what role playing games were meant to be mm-hmm. the storyline characters that, that you end up you end up developing emotion towards like you actually enjoy playing and having that character in your party um and and some people you know everybody has their own taste of it but the way that that functions makes a player want to play the game more because they want to get that character stronger they want mm-hmm. to develop that relationship status like uh, mass effect has where you can actually build relationships w- in between your characters Things like that are phenomenal because you can go different routes with it and it gives you a reason to, to replay it. Like, oh, I really like this character, but I think on my next playthrough, I want to go with this one instead. And you can see what makes life easy and you can make it like, oh, this game was super easy. Let's try playing with like some of the weakest characters and see what happens then. And you start you know, giving a reason and a purpose behind, oh, I spent 12,000 hours playing this game and it's like, why did I do this again? Because you have to have that replay effect. Otherwise, if it's all static, even if it's the best story in the world, once you have it memorized, you have it memorized. Mm. Yeah, one of the things I kind of agree with you on that is a game series that I absolutely love is Fire Emblem. And, you know, when you have characters, it's very similar to, like, Final Fantasy Tactics where someone dies, they die. You know, and Fire Emblem is very similar in that respect where the story is affected by what party members you have available and you can choose who you fight in combat with yada yada um and that's one of the things that i really like about the series and the fact that with dlc they implement new characters uh and they have like standalone stories for these characters and i love that because it does change up the game every time you play it you have a choice to choose one of three houses in the new one and you can choose different different factions in fire emblem and and that is where an rpg for me really really is good that's why i really like jrpgs and i I kind of tried to avoid having a bias for jrpgs over western rpgs because the witcher 3 is a phenomenal game but typically you don't see a lot of those like story altering mechanics in western rpgs unless it's something like the witcher or skyrim where it's very dungeons and dragons answer this prompt in text sort of style Mm -hmm. uh or mass effect even where it's make this decision in text sort of style mm-hmm. fire emblem has the mechanic in combat uh final fantasy same exact thing and there's other games uh near automata where it is based on going to a certain location and other stuff like that but it's never really a choose a or b or c where western rpgs are kind of like a choose your own adventure more or less approach to it i think that both of those are, are great but you know it's something where there, there's a bias to it because I do really like JRPGs, but but JRPGs have sometimes like the most unique mechanics you'd ever think of. For instance, in Dark Souls, the more you die, the harder the game gets. You know, same thing with like Bloodborne. There's really unique mechanics like that in, in RPGs that we don't sometimes think of, and it it's kind of weird to see that you know some of the best RPGs that come out that give you a great dynamic story are just something as simple as giving you choice to do this or choice to do that. But then we completely forget about the dark souls of society where they've got this amazing mechanic hidden behind like the curtain that no one knows about. And it really makes the game even more fantastic if you really think about it. So for me, that's where RPGs can really stand to learn from is have a mechanic or something that, that we, that alters our experience every single time we play it, that, Sometimes we don't know about because if you know that if you kill this person, the game's easier, you're going to kill that person. But if you don't know that if you don't get there fast enough, that person might not be there. And then the story completely changes. There's cool things you can implement like that. And I think I'd like to see that going forward with RPGs. But another genre that I, I really like and I know we all kind of like is the first person shooter genre. And I, I am ready to rip them a new one. What I really am disliking seeing is constant battle royales and I, I do like playing competitive shooters like i do like that a lot um still got the reaction time but as i as i'm getting older now 
I, I realize that it's like th- there's got to be a point where like we we evolve we transcend from first person shooters to something different uh matt what do you think needs to happen in the first person shooter genre for it to you know to transcend i think they need to go back to basics so what i mean by that is tim and i talked about this earlier today we need to kill off battle royale we need to stop making them not 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 like get rid of them completely but let's let's be honest as as much as we make fun of fortnite they're going to be the crown of the battle royale. So stop making ultra semi-realistic battle royales. Stop making, you know, top of, top of the line graphic battle royales. Battlefield, we were talking about Battlefield today. I think what you have to do is go back to basics. And RP, uh, first person shooters, what I'm going to say, I'm going to have a pretender and a contender. And you're going to be like, well, what do you mean? Because this guy, you play this all the time. And this guy, it hasn't been out in years. So contender battlefield franchise always a contender in first person shooter best ballistics best um feel with the controller best combat simulation best war video game first person shooter hands down pretender call of duty call of duty has turned into a childish just <laughs> call of duty has turned into a bullshit option for t- first person shooter over the top hollywood crap if you watch these videos of these guys going oh you, you watch like navy seals or like marines they're commenting on the maneuvers in call of duty it's all for kids that are hopped up on ritalin and who have all these abilities to make all these moves that we can't and i mean it's bullshit it's a pretender and it's dying and the reason why i say that is because they're going stale. So they're always going to make a quick buck. They're going to turn around every year and recycle content. And Tim and I talked about that earlier, so I can't take full credit for that. But uh, yeah, it's it's bullshit. And Call of Duty knows that they're losing the older crowd and the more faithful crowd of gamers because they're they're just they're bringing a new idea and as soon as they bring it it's like uh what's that resident evil game that they like brought it in your face for five seconds all right um rainbow six siege had that like outbreak mode five Mm. seconds in your face best idea they've had in a long time oh 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 oh, no you like it oh too bad oh oh, you want a little more oh oh no we're gonna put it on the shelf and they do and so Call of Duty needs to knock it off, stop trying to be the best at everything, and just get back to basics. Get back to what Battlefield does. There's no better feeling in Battlefield than when you know an enemy's in that room and you can't get to him because he's covering the door. No better feeling than boonk, launching a grenade and yeah. blowing through the wall and then just charging at him and knocking him out. There's no better feeling in first-person shooters than in Battlefield. So that's my hot take. Uh, I, I I appreciate the finger. I appreciate yeah. <laughs> the the realness, but uh, it is what it is. Battlefield does it so much better. Call of Duty needs to step their game up. Yeah, they're flashy, over the top Hollywood. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. It's not it's not boring, but I want to get back to simulation. I want to get back to grounded realism and war simulation. And I think the the fantasy first person shooters, Destiny, great game. The mechanics are fun to play. On the, on the current gen, it's fun to play on console, PC, and I like the the mechanics. I like the supers. I like the abilities. They play a factor. And I really like Destiny's multiplayer map design, for sure. Um, but as far as the multiplayer goes, and the story, eh, take it or leave it. I mean, it is what it is. Maybe first-person shooters stop tacking on a needless story and just either make a great story or just have multiplayer. Don't try to do both. Battlefield 3... Had a decent story, a decent campaign. Battlefield 4 was, meh, okay, it was fun. But get back to the basics. Like, I'm going to say, best first-person shooter military game campaign was Bad Company 2. Hands down. Bad Company 2. <laughs> Tim, take Tim, take it over. Take, Tim, Mike take drop. Over. <laughs> Mike drop. Boom. So, to, to caveat on that, I would say in terms of revolutionizing first-person shooters, um... If you remember the original Xbox game, Black, first game to ever have bullet penetration, being able to shoot through a wall. If you saw something red, it was going to explode. If you saw something that had kind of a gloss coat to it, you could shoot through it and you let you know, even if they're hiding in that room, shoot through that wall, kill them anyway, because you know that little camper isn't going to move 
kill him anyway. Mm. Um, adding features is something that revolutionized games like that, which is why it's one of the very few Xbox original games that's actually on Game Pass. They mm. did that because it's something that revolutionized the industry for gun games. I think to, to go off what Matt was talking about, when you look at Call of Duty, Call of Duty has literally taken after the same replica of Fortnite. They keep reskinning. They release new uh, a, a new season pass that has all these skins for the guns, for the characters, and what is it? It's literally like whatever's popular. Oh, there's a bunch of new horror movies coming out. Cool, we're gonna make horror skins. It's gonna be blood covered, smoky. Cool. That's uh, that's that's the next skin. Oh, now it's a big cartoon season. Okay, we're gonna make them all animated and dopey looking so that they have like a big inflatable like duck on them. Yes, this is what's gonna be popular now. <laughs> and then the next season is like, oh, it's all about anime. Cool. We're gonna make all of our females have extremely large boobs and and let them wander around. The in next to nothing of clothing. Does any of that make sense in an actual combat scenario? No. You made a comment when I first jumped on with you. I've never seen a character in more armor. Why? Because I'm a (laughs) previous soldier. I'm a veteran. And I'm like, I need more armor. This isn't enough. I I, I want dragon scale. I I want everything I can possibly have on my character. Does that make a difference? No. Unfortunately. I wish it did. But then it becomes a pay-to-win game where whoever has the most armor on their character would win. Mm-hmm. Um, but but that's just what Call of Duty did. Is they said, oh, Fortnite is making a killing by just doing skins. Why don't we just do that? And they made loot boxes, and they make thousands of skins now. And they don't have to focus on making and re- revolutionizing gun games. They're like, okay, we're the epitome of gun games. We win. Mm-hmm. Until the next franchise that invents something new comes out. And when that happens, Call of Duty will completely die because no one really cares about it. Not truly. You can, you can, you can take that for what it's worth, but people do it because they're online with friends. They're goofing off. They're just having fun. That's mostly what it is. Nobody I know is like, oh, I can't wait for the next Call of Duty story game. Yeah. No one does that. They literally get on because it's what it's multiplayer and that's what all their friends do. <laughs> That's just what it is. So yeah. when you take that and compare it to something that has a storyline, or if it's not going to have a storyline, make a realistic mode. Even their hardcore mode, I guarantee you, does not have the same feel of what Battlefield does. Mm-hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll grant him that. It is by far the most realistic in terms of gameplay, gunplay, um, tactics. You know, Even when you get to that like Warzone feel where it's like 36 on 36... When you have those massive chaotic instances, that is good realism. When you have the guy who just keeps respawning and not caring, who just charges at you wielding a submachine gun, trying to kill it from Texas to Wisconsin, mm. I don't think that's going to work, dude. Just, just you literally, you're throwing your life away at that point. So I think there's there's defining lines for what the games are meant to be, and Call of Duty basically has just checked out in terms of gameplay. Mm-hmm. They're like, we already know what we're good at. We're just going to stick with it and reskin it, and that's the problem. And a lot of it, they aren't the only ones that do that though. I, I won't I won't just call them out. I will also call out plenty of other games that just keep reskinning the same game. Uh, mm-hmm. Personally, I'm I'm a huge Diablo fan, right? Their seasons are literally just their, like, once you beat the storyline for Diablo 3, you're playing the same game. The expansion to add the Necromancer back. Awesome. I love the Necromancer in 2. I was happy to have it in 3. But does that give me another reason to play and beat the game again? Maybe. For some players, like diehard fans like me, I was just happy to have the Necromancer again. So I did play through and beat it a second time just to have a, a Necromancer at, at cap level. My first character was a witch doctor. I just like that style of gameplay. But other than maybe you can beat it, let's say that you love every type of character enough to beat it one time for each. At the end, you have a max level character of all classes. What do you do then? You just wait for the next season to drop where it gives you a few new skinned items, and that's it. There, there are plenty of things that lose their replay value where they could just revolutionize, make an expansion like Borderlands. Borderlands is a good example of this, where they said, 
we are a loot based game and we know that we have kind of an off-putting uh, art style but every expansion that they come out with has literally been gold for me i enjoy the new character aspects i enjoy the new equipment the new raids it actually gives you a reason to play um destiny i mean i i get it their expansions are a lot smaller which is really like i feel uncomfortable having to pay 30 dollars for you know five hours of content plus a bunch of new reskinned oh, not even new reskinned weapons that were from d1 that people are just like this was like a really good feeling gun the palindrome i love this gun here have it back why do i have to pay money to have it back Mm -hmm. that, that's something I should have never lost. Mm. So there are certain games and certain aspects that always do that, where they just run into a brick wall and they need to do better. Uh, this is like to, towards all the game developers. If you want to keep your, your franchise growing instead of just, you know, the diehards and the occasional new player that their friends rope them into it, you want something new, make something new, make mm -hmm. a new mechanic, make, do you have any idea how much money somebody would make if they could do uh, like a wanted game? Curve the bullet, like literally hold down your trigger uh, and, and thing and be able to just whip the gun. If you could create even just for like a curving line, you hold the left trigger, you hold the right trigger. When you release it, it shoots the round. Your character whips the gun and you just see this thing continuously make an arc. As it whips past somebody, you release, it shoots that round right then. If you can time it properly, because you were talking about having to have quick reflexes. That's a that's a game mechanic that could go into place that, albeit, it may not be, you know, pristine looking at the start, mm -hmm. but it's something they could work on and revolutionize and just make a full new type of game from that one aspect. Is that realistic? No. Mm -hmm. But it would be something new that would that would catch capture people's attention that would create something that's innovative. And I think that's something they need to get back to. Making basics of what made the next sequel graphics for a long time we focused on graphics we focused on frame rate and resolution and stuff like that made a difference more recently graphics are pretty much capped you can play a game almost in 4k especially with upscaling now mm -hmm. but just because your graphics got better if the gameplay is the same gameplay from 10 years ago why would i care mm -hmm. that's the unfortunate side effect is Everything has been stagnated in terms of new development because as soon as something is successful, everybody just copies it and makes it their own. Mm -hmm. Assassin's Creed, Fortnite, Call of Duty has been doing it for years. Halo did it for a while. Now Halo's actually having to reorganize and completely redefine what it was in order to become popular again mm -hmm. because they basically lost out in the war against Call of Duty for a while. And then... Now they're actually rescaping it and saying, you know what? We're going to do something new. And that's what's pulling so much attention for Halo Infinite now. Yeah, I agree with that. I think a lot of first-person shooters, especially, they, there's something about, you know, Call of Duty is an arcade-style shooter. It's not a simulation. And, and for me, some of my favorite first-person shooters are arcade-style shooters with my friends. But the ones that I, I think of when recommending people to first-person shooters who don't come to the first-person shooter genre are games like Metroid Exodus, like games that are amazing experiences in a first person like perspective. Um, Boneworks is a VR first person shooter with fantastic physics. You know, it's one of the first ever games I recommend in VR. Same thing with like Air Car, another VR experience, another first person. It's not really a shooter; it's a driver technically, but still a first person first person experience. And I think games like Metro do a really good job of not only lighting technology, but like world physics, like your lighter will like set uh, cobwebs and stuff on fire. You have to wipe your mask uh, from like water droplets that fall on top of you and stuff like that. Your gun gets mud on it and stuff like that. When you lay prone, there's a lot of cool stuff like that that is incorporated into the game um, that I think that other first person shooters like Battlefield, where they pay a lot of attention to detail, uh, can benefit from, you know, those little mechanics, you know, just make the world so much more immersive or Call of Duty. It's very just scoreboard, leaderboard, eSport, just in instant gratification. It's an instant gratification shooter, you know, battlefields, mm -hmm. a lot more of a simulation. Same thing with like Arma, where it's a very slow, methodic, like 
long-term gratification. And for me, the first-person shooter genre really lacks because it, there are limitations to the genre. You know, you can't make... You, you really can't make a Final Fantasy with first-person shooter guns. You know, I mean, they're trying to with the with the Final Fantasy Battle Royale, which I'll play. Um, but then again, it's a Battle Royale. Battle Royale, I think, is just... It's kind of where first-person shooters are settling right now. I don't think it's going to be something that's going to go away anytime soon because it's very it's very similar to that instant gratification. Like, you can just hop in, hop out. The, the, the mindset for it makes a lot of sense. The issue that I have with it is that you have people like, like Battlefield, <clears throat> like DICE, who specialize in making really good open-world environments for combat in a big, large-scale simulation and now are trying to simulate a battle royale and it turns out to be garbage and it's dead within a month, you know? And that's where you get other games like Titanfall 2, fantastic game, and they make Apex Legends, which is a fantastic battle royale. That's that's kind of where I'm like, okay, that's that's how it should be done, you know? You make a really good first-person shooter, you make a really good battle royale. Fine with that, never fault you for that. But you make Battlefield, uh, battlefield 5, which is an okay game, and then you make their battle royale, and it's horrible. It's horrible. There, there's no reason you should have even invented it, you know. And that's my issue with first-person shooters is that they're trying to, they're trying to keep up with this battle royale thing, uh, battle royale theme. But I think they should just scrap it. Like Left 4 Dead 2 is still one of my favorite first-person shooters ever. I played the crap out of that on the Xbox 360, and it was because it was different than everything else. Plus, you could play by yourself with bots, and I love that. I loved bots. Uh, and I think more games have to be like that, you know, where it's like arcadey, like survival is not bad. But then you go to something like Scum, where it's like super survival, like you need to manage your water and you play DayZ and you have to manage like all of your bullets and stuff like that. It's that's a little too intense for me, but I get the appeal to survival first person shooters that are realistic like that. And same thing with Battlefield, it's a little too realistic for me because I don't necessarily want to get run over by a tank every five minutes. So there's. There's got to be an arcade and a simulation variant, I think, for most first-person shooters. And that's kind of where Call of Duty fits right now, is it's the quick arcade staple for most people, you know? And I I, I fear that it's not going to go anywhere, because I don't want it to go anywhere. I honestly love Call of Duty, because it is it is a game that you can buy and and say, I get I would get this experience out of it. And Call of Duty, I, I never go, it's going to be a 10 out of 10 game, but I at least can guarantee that it'll be a 7 out of 10 every single time I buy it, you know? And that's something that first-person shooters, unfortunately and fortunately, suffer from, is you know the experience you're getting into every single time, you know? And that's kind of, there's, there's, there's limitations on that. That's my only downside to that. But I don't want to take up all the time here on the podcast talking about that, guys. Let's, uh, let's get right into that save point. So, you've got some uh, exciting news for us, sir. Yes. Uh, earlier this week, uh, Matt's actually editing it right now. He's in the process of editing it. We got to interview the game publishers, uh, game publishers, game distributors for Super Blood Hockey Premium Edition games. Uh, so they released a physical edition of Super Blood Hockey, and I was able to get a one-on-one -on -one interview with part of the team. We were able to discuss some things. They were able to show off some cool patches, and you guys can check it out in our YouTube channel. We'll leave a link in the description, and uh, feel free to shoot that some some love. If you guys like that, please let us know. We want to do more stuff like that and try to figure out what we can do for the channel. Um and Matt and Tim wrote questions to it too, and I got to ask your guys' questions. I did not get to ask him what his favorite game was, though. I, I'm sorry, Matt, I didn't get to answer, ask that question for you. But, so was mine, but okay. That was, that was <laughs> oh, that's yours, Tim. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you guys put it both in there, but no, it, there was a really good one that, that Tim had in there. I merged them all together. Um, ah, crap. What, what questions did you ask him? I forgot what questions you asked. So m the main one that I asked is basically as a game publisher developer you know distributor um at what point do you start really focusing on the game is it you know because of the storyline because of the stage of development that it's at because they've already put you know 20,000 man hours into the the creation of it um at what point do you say yes i want to take the risk on this game uh and, and what kind of pushes that decision mm -hmm. that was basically my question yeah there's a lot of cool questions like that one of the 
things that came up was like doubts that they had that the project will get released. So we don't want to spoil too much, but questions like that will be answered in the one-on-one -on -one interview. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. If you guys have any comments or uh, idea topics for Just the Digital, feel free to reach out to us on our social medias or leave a comment in the video on YouTube uh, if you haven't already. Uh, but yeah, that was pretty much it. That's, that's all I got to say. Matt, you want to close us off here? Yeah, so uh, I want to go kind of close us off here with uh, just a simple topic. So I'm going to go with an individual choice of mine, something that's been kind of near and dear to my heart here with uh, sports titles. And so when you look at sports titles, you look at if you're looking like who's a pretender, who's a contender, what's the best, what's the eh, okay, maybe. And uh, I think for my pretender, I think I'm, it pains me to say this because I'm a diehard Madden fan, but I got to go with Madden every uh -huh. year. Same crap, rinse, repeat. And here's the thing. It's not that it's not fun. It's fun to play with friends. It's fun to be competitive. It's fun to play with new rosters every year, but that's all you get. Mm -hmm. I miss the good old days of Madden NFL football where they had training camp where you had to play as the quarterback and drop back and dodge, whoa, <laughs> whoa, dodge the the tennis balls and you know the cornerback you're playing defense you break off you have to go run in there and grab the ball i miss the drills i miss the fun that they made the game i miss the importance of franchise mode mm -hmm. of winning the super bowl and this is pre madden online this is all, this is before all this crap started i think that's where they they went the the sports titles they, they go the route of um ultimate team and mm -hmm. uh, diamond dynasty and mlb the show and they put all this focal point on pay money for legendary players or popular players to build your team and compete with your friends and that takes a significant chunk of resources from the actual game whether it be the rosters or the stadiums or the just all-out gameplay mechanics i think the biggest thing madden suffers from every year is they only have a short window of development cycle between the next year. So they really only put one or two game mechanics in. I can't tell you how many... I waited 15 years to be able to play on defense and <laughs> swat the ball out of the air on defense. I waited 15 years to have the truck stick and to shoulder check through and charge a guy. You know, you waited forever and a day to be able to actually drop back and then control your receivers and run out there. And Madden is best when you're with friends and he, he, not playing together on the same team. Oh, uh. that's when it's the best because your buddy can play receiver, tight end, run out and catch a pass, and you can throw it to him. And then it's on you. If you screwed up, it's not the computer. You just miss communication. On defense also, playing on a team with somebody, you know, the person actually is a lot of fun. So... Madden is going to be my pretender. They have a long way to go. I don't think they're ever going to reach a peak. Maybe with the next, maybe with this next gen. Now, this last Madden, I bought 21 just for just for shits and giggles on uh, Series X. Phenomenal experience. It was way better than the previous years. They actually, mm -hmm. the regular version versus the, the updated version was completely different. Completely different experience. Smoother. Um, just better response time. They added a lot of graphical things to the stadium and cheerleaders and fireworks and presentation package top notch. That's where I want to see Madden go. But I still think that they're going to be held back by the short dev cycle and lack of resources. And they've gone towards the ultimate team. And that just to me, it takes, takes it away from the overall fun experience. And for me, the contender, absolute king crown of sports titles, a lot of people are going to say NBA 2K. I know. Nah, I'm not, not my thing. MLB The Show is by far the best sports franchise over the new revival of PGA Tour. That gets an honorable mention. The revival of Tiger Woods, by the way. <laughs> Tiger Woods is now back as the cover boy of, of golf. And it, it trumps that. It trumps NHL. I'd hate to say because NHL, and that's a hard trump. NHL is phenomenal. I love playing that. Um, but MLB The Show just takes the crown with the love and affection that they put into the game. The resources they have are very limited, and Sony does a fantastic job. And this year, finally, coming to all platforms, at least coming over to the Xbox. I know they have a Switch port they're working on, but I think because of COVID, they're not going to have it out this year. Mm. But uh, MLB The Show, if you're not a baseball fan, still give it a try. 
uh, this year they're doing a better job more than ever of making it accessible across all platforms, cross-platform for the first time, and it's going to be an exciting run. MLB The Show does it right because they improve on things every single year. They listen to the community, they listen to the fans, they, they implement these changes, and they do have a Diamond Dynasty, which is like online best teams and all that stuff, um, but they, they use that as a tool to fine tune the game all year long. They put out updates like every week. It's crazy. So if you haven't had a chance, check it out. MLB The Show, legit sports contender for the crown. Mm. What about you, Tim? What's uh, what's your genre of choice there? So my genre of choice is something that y'all kind of dodge because I'm pretty sure neither of you are huge fans. Um, fighting games. Mm. Huge fan of fighting games. Have been for a long time. I've played countless hours on them and playing king of the hill with your friends is by far one of the best experiences just to give bragging rights to you when you're at work and stuff um so i'm gonna say in terms of my pretender uh pretender is actually mortal kombat 11 i hate to say that because mortal kombat has been near and dear to me since the original nintendo like nes I loved that game. I followed it all the way through for the storyline, for the gameplay. Unfortunately, when they did 11, they butchered themselves. They ruined all of their timing mechanics from X. X was great. I loved the XXL uh, whenever whenever they came out with it. Uh, all the add-on characters were great. And the actual roster for 11 is phenomenal. Like, it's a fun game. But they messed up the actual, like, engine that they used, so the timing got changed, all of the veteran players had to basically relearn how to do the inputs, um, the, the actual special moves are still pretty similar, but in terms of doing your strings and your juggles with it, it's, they, they literally shot themselves in the foot. All of the people that I know that, that I play with on a consistent basis for that, they just they aren't impressed with what 11 did mm -hmm. they they wish it, they'd have stuck with the at least you know the mortal kombat x system for mm -hmm. input because it was so much easier to do your juggles your strings and and have fun playing it beating your friends up uh however i will say that my contender has got to be soul caliber no. soul caliber yeah is is underrated in terms of what people think of when they started making the custom creation of characters being able to not only use either the default move set of another character and reskin it to the uh, the appeal of you but taking the game a step further and adding in your own special moves and being able to put in custom moves into that character as well that, that just blew my mind. I was like, wow, so now not only do I get the skin I want, and I can use the timing and base moves of, of, a, of a preordained character that I'm used to using, but I can combo in and throw in other special moves that are unique just to that character. Um, doing that, that has got to be one of the top premium ideas to come out in a fighting game for character creation, for being able to do strings, for being able to be competitive in nature and have you know less input lag and still have something that's so unique, hands down, top of the line contender right there for me. Oh, nice. That's that is a good one. I, I love Soul Calibur, especially when they added two B. Love love Soul Calibur. Um, for me, I chose rhythm games. It's a genre that no one ever talks about uh, unless you're really big in the Guitar Hero community. I won't touch Guitar Hero because that's. That's untouchable. You can't really fault Guitar Hero. My pretender is it was gonna be Guitar Hero, but then I'm like, it's iconic. It's it's DJ Hero, man. It's who who who's still playing DJ Hero in 2021? <laughs> yeah, no one plays that game. I don't even think you can find the DJ Hero things. But like, you know, when you think of rhythm games, like I don't know anybody who's going out and buying fake plastic instruments anymore. You know. But really, for me, the the biggest letdown is the fact that like games like Rock Band have have diminished to nothing. You know, that's that's the unfortunate side of it. Is and, and Rock Band should 
you know, continue to be something, but it's just, there's no market for it. You know, like the one or two times a year you'll play rock band and bust out all the instruments and stuff. It's, it's not marketable for them. So yeah, my, that might actually have to be the, the pretender is rock band. It's unfortunate, <laughs> but it's just, it's dying. It's dead. It's no one's doing it anymore, you know? And I, I wish they did. I wish there was a way for them to continue that, but then you can just go online and play a torrented version of it and it's way better. Mm-hmm. And you get all, all the updated songs for free. Um, we don't believe in torrenting here on just the digital. I'm just saying that it exists, you know? <laughs> um, but the ultimate rhythm game, the contender is just dance, man. It's dance, dance mm. revolution without having to pull out the mats. You don't have to pop in massive amounts of quarters. And I played it for the first time earlier this year with, uh, my girlfriend I had a bunch of her friends over and we played just dance for the first time. And I, I got to admit, I, I, I was digging it. I was really digging it. We played it on the Switch, little Joy-Cons in the air. I, I don't know what it was, man. It just There's something about, you know, sometimes busting a move, you know, like, you know, Cabbage Patch, anything, you know, like Running Man, it doesn't matter, you know. Just the rhythm, getting up and moving is good. And I think that Just Dance is like, it's kind of like the Pokemon Let's Go of, like, rhythm games. It gets you up and moving, it gets you working out, you know. It's, it's just something that everyone likes, you know. It's too bad that Rock Band doesn't exist anymore, otherwise that would have been my contender (laughs) but uh that being said ladies and gentlemen i think that's about all the time we have for this week Uh, thank you so much for joining us this week with this to digital and thank you tim for coming on to the show again this week it was great to have you Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then also if you have any questions or comments feel free to reach out to us on our social media with the hashtag just to digital and don't forget you can always check us out on Discord and Facebook, where we share some of our greatest, greatest, blah, 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 greatest gaming experiences. Oh, we gotta redo the whole entire podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> way to go, way to go, man! No, I, got, I got time. But, <laughs> I'm le- I'm leaving this in, by the way. Yeah, no. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm gonna have the laugh track and everything. We'll be good. Oh yeah, no problem. <laughs> Feel free to stop on by, anyways. Um, we do have an application open for a new closer now that matt has been messing this one up uh so (laughs) feel free to send your applications this way um but from all of us here at dista digital i'm brett clark i'm matt keaton and i'm tim and we'll catch you guys in the next one take care see you matt you're fired (laughs) (laughs) tim what's your availability like (laughs) 